It's the big break. Semi-final night, second semi-final. Up for grabs, of course. A free office at Dubai Airport, free zone for a year. Quarter of a million dirhams of radio adverts here at ARN. Just a reminder of our judges this evening. We have Nasa Al Madani, Assistant Director General at Dubai Airport Free Zone Authority, and also Edward Roderick, Co-Chairman of Investors Mina. So let's meet our second contestant this evening. She is Devayani Dayal of She Moves Company. Devayani, we're going to get onto your company a little bit later on. I'm going to ask you to remind us about She Moves Company. First of all, though, our task for this evening, and you've had this for 48 hours. It's a developer turnaround strategy for an ailing international company. You're on the shortlist to become the new chief executive, and you've got a meeting with the board of directors, the judges, to explain your strategy and convince them you're the right person for the job. Tonight, the strategy is, just to remind you, the New York Times company and Devayani was in the green room with the volume turned down while our last contestant was uh, was was giving his strategy, so she hasn't heard anything that Mohammed Kazim said so here we go new york times company stock down 20 percent last year 60 percent down over the past five years just last month fired its long-serving chief executive now the company new york times company still profitable but only just revenue has fallen sharply over the past five years as the newspaper industry comes to terms with challenges from the internet. So, Devayani, let's hear your strategy for turning around the New York Times company. First question goes to one of our judges this evening, Nasser Al-Madani. Devayani, uh, you've studied this case now for 48 hours. What would be, if I ask you, the three main strategies that you would put forward to, to, to make a turnaround for the company. Okay, good evening, everyone. Lovely to be in the hot seat again. Mm-hmm. Um, I think uh, in order to be able to say what the three strategies are, we'd have to be able to identify what's wrong in the current situation. In my opinion, I think there's just two things that are missing in, in, in this particular scenario. Uh, one is you have this huge, massive company that is a news organization, great history, great credibility, great brand, um, but still believes that it's a print-driven company in a digital age. So this is, of course, uh, I mean, an industry-wide uh, problem. And no doubt the New York Times company is facing the same issue. The second issue, I think, is a little bit to do with the website, New York Times company website. It has a huge following, 20 to 30 million unique visitors per day, massive. But for some reason, I feel that the company is unable to monetize the website. It's unable to monetize and harness the amount of power that's coming in. So I think my strategy uh, to answer your question would be threefold. I have a short term, medium and long term plan. Short term, I think just to blast revenues right away and to get money going is to get the International Herald Tribune to start distributing in different languages in the 180 countries that it's already in. Currently, it's only in English. And some of these countries are kind of behind us in terms of market maturation. Literacy is growing. People are learning their language, learning how to write, learning how to read. So I think it's a great idea to actually get newspapers in the local languages. Second thing we'll tack, I think, should tackle the consumer perception. Everybody thinks the New York Times, great, credible history, all of those things, but for some reason puts them in the gray old lady category. It, we know that it was one of the last newspapers to take on color photography, one of the last newspapers to do advertising on the front page, one of the last newspapers to go from eight columns to six columns, which is the industry standard. So I think in order to tackle the perception, I want to address the issue of the Generation Y and the Generation Z co- sorry, consumer online. So I think for the news online, there should be a pay per click system to be able to view it. I'm a generation Y person. I'm a digital native. I look at my movies on timeoutdubai.com. I barely read the newspaper when I go to the bathroom in the morning. I have my iPad and I look through the news. You know, I'm not a a Generation X or a baby boomer who's used to reading the newspaper cover to cover. So what I I, we we are running short of time. I'm going to bring in Edward Roderick now. Okay. Why didn't the prior management identify what seemed to be obvious strategies that you've come out and what prevented them implementing them? I feel that this comes down to the mindset. At the moment, the company has the Salzburger family influence very strongly, which is a very heritage-based family. 
The company is also uh, known for its credibility and they do, I mean, they've won tons of Pulitzer Prizes for the research writing and the investigative reporting. These articles, some of them take months to write. So uh, it's natural that a company that prides itself so much in its heritage is slow to adopt change. So I think that that is exactly what's happening here. So are you suggesting that the quality of the content should decline in order to reduce the costs? No, not at all. Or that they should charge more for what they do? No, I think it's just a ma- it's just a mismanagement issue. I don't think they should charge more, and I don't think the quality needs to go down at all. Pay-per-click, if I, I'll finish my idea, a traditional person, which would read the newspaper, would spend $2 a day to read the paper from cover to cover. What I'm suggesting is I should have his username, I should have a login, I should have my credit card details already in there. When I log in, I can log in from my iPad, my iPhone, whatever, and I shouldn't pay more than a dollar a day. So... As a Generation Y consumer, I want ease of use. I want the company that I'm working with to reward me and to see that I can have access to everything. I'm going to bring in Nasser Ahmadani in a second. Just a very quick follow-up question from Edward first. Likes of the Financial Times and whatever are trying to charge for people online. What's their penetration rate of success on that? Um, Well, I know that the Wall Street Journal right now is charging $40 a month uh, in order to read the news, and that's a flat fee, a very, very capitalist sort of strategy from Rupert Murdoch, but I don't think it should be that way. I think it should be pay-per-click at one cent per article, so whatever you read, the maximum it will be is $1, and on average you'd be paying maybe $10 to $20 a month, maybe, at most, if you go through that many articles. Nasser Al-Madani. Daviani, uh, it's not very easy for the newspaper to just move immediately to a, an, a, a digital mm-hmm. newspaper. Mm-hmm. So it, the print will continue for a few years to come. How, what, what do you do to increase the revenue from the advertising in the print media? Okay. Well, actually, I don't believe, I believe that print has a place in our lives always. There will always be people young and old that want to hold a paper. So I don't actually believe that we should uh, reduce print. I think we just need to maximize the unrealized revenue in the internet. So currently, if you look at the the figures, uh, I mean, I have them down in my notes, but I don't remember, but I remember making a note that the advertising amount of revenue that is collected from the newspaper actually supports its entire paper distribution. So right now they're already making money. Print is already about 37% of their revenue. Internet is only about 14%. What I'm saying is keep print as it is. Maximize it in the emerging markets where people are still using print. But this 14% of internet needs to be up to 30-40%. That's what I'm saying. Print isn't going anywhere, in my opinion. A couple of uh, final quick questions from our judges. First of all, Nasser Al-Madani. I'll follow up on that question. But uh, I want to answer what would you do to increase the revenue from the advertising in the print media. In the print media. Yeah. Wow. Tuffy. Let me think about that. Okay. I think print media is is already on its uh it's it's a little bit on its decline in terms of advertising because people who read the newspaper like to go through it from cover to cover, they get very used to the kind of media that's already there and the kind of advertising. So I think the best thing to do in order to increase that kind of revenue is to have a sales team that would look at the content and then call advertisers and have a call to action. They would say, have better promotions, develop better advertising products where the advertiser can speak to the user. And again, I know you're, you're saying print media is the thing, but I think it should be paired with options from the internet. If I come to you and I say you're an advertiser, I'll give you this much for this much money in the newspaper. I'm also going to give you this much space in the, on the website. That's where I think we would go. Final quick question to Edward. Do you think on that basis then that the analysis of those who are the readers on the internet would give you a better opportunity to identify who should be advertisers for the print media? Could you repeat that question? Yeah, on on the basis that you know the the type A, B, C people who read the newspaper on the internet, wouldn't that be a good start point to to uh, position people for advertising? Yeah, absolutely. In the papers, absolutely. Actually, um, this is an interesting point you bring. If my strategy would be to implement it and everybody had logins and usernames and all that stuff, that means every time somebody reads an article, the paper would know their age, would know their name, would know where they're uh, located, and all of this information can be harnessed. Uh, In fact, uh, just, uh, you know, we've been talking to some malls. We might be opening a store please, God, maybe, hopefully, if it happens. But if that happens, you know, one of the malls that we spoke to said, 
if you want a location here, you have to have a location here. And I felt that I was being a bit, my arm was being twisted a bit because I felt that that, but that can happen. You can say, if you want to advertise on the internet and that's the profit center, you got to advertise in the print media as well. You know, that can be done. Daviana Dayal of She Moves Company, thanks very much indeed for your analysis of the New York Times, its challenges and possible solutions. We're going to take a few minutes now just to learn a little bit and remind ourselves about your business. Uh, she Moves Company, 30 seconds, tell us, what do you do? Okay, our company, shemovesonline.com. Uh, we are a company that is obsessed with movement and movement wear and healthy living. Technically, we sell dancewear and activewear. Dancewear is technical clothing for ballet, for jazz, for contemporary and uh, hip hop. And activewear is clothing for exercise, but it borrows from the fashion industry its sizing and its styling, so it looks good. And it borrows from the fitness industry the performance aspects such as sweat, absorption, uh, durability, and stretch. Okay, and talk to us about the company. It's a fairly new company in yeah. terms of, of revenue profitability. I know you're at the early stages yet, or perhaps more relevant for such a new company, your your price point. How much are you selling this stuff for and what profit margins are you making per, per item? I, I can definitely give you some numbers. You know, we relaunched the site on December 6th. Prior to that, we were just selling dancewear in a very offline kind of mode. Since December 6th, I have some really awesome uh, news to tell you. I mean, we are, our average basket value is about five to 600 dirhams with about two to three items items in there. On a social media front, it has been explosive. Our Facebook followers in the last three weeks went from 100 to over 1,100. And on a newsletter sign-up uh, sort of uh, degree, we have uh, crossed 2,000 people who are interested in it. We've just been approached by the leading ladies club in Jumeirah and the number one airline in the region for ver- various joint ventures. So I-, I think there's a lot of potential. I mean, we're hoping to break even by about October. If the big break happens, maybe it could be sooner. You know, we don't know. But uh, things are looking very promising so far. A couple of quick questions to our judges. First of all, Edward Roderick. What differentiates your products from anybody else who's in the sort of sporty, relaxed clothes market? I'm glad you asked that. I've been rehearsing this and I've been wanting to say it. You know, we are a crossover brand. And the first time I came here, I remember Tim said, you know, there are so many crossover brands, blah, blah, blah. But everybody hasn't realized that they're only for men. You have crossover brands like North Face, Columbia, Gantt, Nautica, Lacoste. Where are these brands for women? Nowhere. That's where we come in, you know. Edward, follow-up question? Yeah, and are are the products purely for sporty girls, or are they for everybody? No, they're absolutely for everybody. In fact, that is our main USP. We make clothing for people who want to have an active and healthy lifestyle, but are not necessarily athletes. I have clothing for my mom, who is... uh, you know, a chubby lady, and I have clothing for people who are runners as well. And I, we have an incredible range for yoga, for Pilates, for dance, for ballet. It's just, you know, I think women would love it. As soon as they find out about us, they usually love it. Nasa Al Madani. Daviani, there is a fine line okay. how much of fashion and how much of practicality okay. you have in a sports clothing. Mm-hmm. How you define that fine line? I mean, if you go too much toward the fashion, it becomes impractical. If it goes too much towards the sport, okay. then probably won't be attractive from yes. your point of view. That's not fashionable. Well, I think it depends on uh, styling. You know, when something is made with performance wear fabric, it doesn't matter how you style it. We know that it's going to be durable. We know it's going to maintain shape integrity. And we also know that it's going to absorb sweat and not let it stretch uh, show on the other side. So as long as you use performance fabric, it's great if you style it like a fashion item. You know, so that's that's where the line is. They have different functions in the design. It's not a system where if you have 50% fashion, you are having to forego 50% performance. That's not it at all. It's a merger of two worlds. Final question to you, Nasa Almadani. So you still give more attention to the performance rather than to the, the way it looks? Absolutely. There's, uh, well, that, that's a tricky one, but I think... No matter how it looks, it will always perform well. It can be fashionable to some people. It might be boring to some people because it's, it's an artistic thing. Deviani Dayal of She Moves. Thanks very much indeed. Deviani's going to wait in the green room while our third and final contestant this evening joins us in the studio.